I wish it were possible for me to speak personally to each one of you in IBM this morning and to your families. I believe the more we understand about each other and the policies on which this company was founded, the better <coughs> equipped we are to meet a very challenging future. Unfortunately, our size makes this impossible. And so we have taken this means of trying to get together with you for a minute and tell you a little bit about IBM in the future. Late last year, we held a conference in Williamsburg, Virginia, at which we announced a new organizational structure for our company. We had simply outgrown our former organization, and I believe that the changes we made in Williamsburg will not only make it easier to realize the great growth potential which lies ahead of our company, but that it will give each ibm -er, a maximum opportunity for personal growth as well. As a part of that realignment, a top policy-making group was formed, the Corporate Management Committee. That committee sits before you this morning, and I'd like to introduce each one of them to you. Executive Vice President L.H. Lamott, in charge of the Data Processing Division. Executive Vice President A.L. Williams, who heads up the corporate staff. A.K. Watson, President of the World Trade Corporation, our international subsidiary. Vice President T.V. Learson, Group Executive responsible for the Military Products Division, Time Equipment and Special Engineering Products Division, as well as a reporting point for our independent subsidiary, the Service Bureau Corporation. Vice President H.W. Miller, Jr., Group Executive heading up the Electric Typewriter Division and the Supply Division. An effective organizational structure, however, important as it is, is only a single part of IBM and its success. The key factor is, and always has been, people. Between 1914, when my father was employed, and 1956, when the first chapter of our history closed with his death, perhaps the most outstanding characteristic of our company was its great success, its great progress, in its relationships with the men and women who are IBM. This was no accident, for my father and his associates who guided IBM over the years were convinced that progress for the company and progress for IBM people were completely interwoven, each working to enhance the other. A substantial amount of management time has been devoted over the years to the welfare of employees. It's been a subject of prime concern for every manager. The same thing is true today. Our objective is to continue to be a pace setter in this important area of business. We ask each of you to discuss any problems you may have with your manager. If he can't help, you should feel perfectly free to go to the next manager, and the next until you receive a satisfactory answer. If you're still troubled, I hope you'll come to me, for I want to talk with anyone in IBM who needs help. There are many things which I want the IBM company to be, but most of all, I want it to be known as the company that has the greatest respect for the individual. And now, what does the future hold? We're in the midst of a very sizable expansion, and my associates and I have been spending a good deal of time recently planning for the next five years. Looking at the results which our various divisions are forecasting, has given me a great thrill and a solid sense of confidence in the future. We expect a greater percentage growth per year than during any similar period in the history of our company. The future for our corporation and for each of us looks better than ever before. In meeting the challenge of this wonderful future, I want each one of you to know that my associates and I believe implicitly in the fundamental management philosophies founded by T.J. Watson. Policies so sound and so firm that there will be no change in the basic approach which brought about the great industrial team we have today. With these underlying policies as guideposts, and with your continued support, I know we can face a bright future with complete confidence. You are about to see a filmed report of some of the progress we made during the past year. The years that lie ahead in IBM will bring the same progress as in the past. And every one of us 
will participate in that brilliant future. <laughs> I'm Walter Cronkite. For the past 12 months, our news cameras have been focused on the International Business Machines Corporation. During the most dynamic expansion period in the company's history, we've been talking to salesmen, customer engineers, scientists, plant employees, executives. We've been seeing new plants, new people, new discoveries in technology. New products or major devices have been announced on the average of one every two weeks. We've seen the number of IBMers increase by 25%. The total sales jumped by approximately 29%. The report on the progress of IBM during 1956 is before us now. The reason for IBM's present success, according to Thomas J. Watson, Jr., president of the company, is the spirit and enthusiasm of the IBM people themselves. The 59,000 IBMers of 12 months ago plus the 15,000 new people hired during this period. That number of new people is more than were with the whole company in 1941. The most dramatic area of IBM's manpower growth has been in customer engineering. More than 3,500 new customer engineers in 12 months in the data processing, electric typewriter, and time equipment division. Our cameras were at the homestead in Endicott, New York recently to see one of these new customer engineers as he listens to a welcoming address by J.J. Kenney, Vice President of Service, during graduation ceremonies. The first milestone of a customer engineer's IBM career. This is Dick Keller, Cincinnati, Ohio, one of more than 10,000 young men who have been graduated from the training program. Dick's IBM career began several months before at the suggestion of a friend who works for the company. In the branch office, Dick learned a recommendation from an IBMer gets number one priority for new people. The company management's reason? The people it most wants to hire are people like the ones it already has. Dick's background in electronics and the personal impression he made led the branch manager to suggest a job as a customer engineer. The manager explained that both technical knowledge and a pleasant personality are essential to customer engineers since they are the men who have the most contact with the company's customers on a day-by-day, long-term basis. The most advanced electronic equipment in the world is being designed and manufactured by IBM. Once the sale has been made, it is the customer engineer's technical knowledge and concern which safeguard the reputation of the company. Within a few weeks, Dick was at Endicott where he would spend about four months learning the mass of technical information needed by an IBM customer engineer. Equally important, he would learn about IBM, about the spirit that motivates its people in their relationships with customers and with each other. Later on, of course, Dick may return to school for additional training. With more than 3,500 new customer engineers being hired each year, more and more opportunities are opening for advancement into management. The current growth in manufacturing engineering is creating additional management opportunities for customer engineers in these areas. This is a period of concentrated study and hard work. The course includes some of the complex theory behind IBM technology and how that theory is applied to specific machines. Practical experience is also a large part of the course. In this laboratory, an instructor has altered the machine so that it will not work properly. The difficulty might be found at a customer's location. It is now Dick's task to find the trouble and to correct it. 
14 weeks, the basic course is over. Dick receives his diploma and the congratulations of W.F. Gherkin, manager of customer engineering in the data processing division. For Dick Keller, as for all the members of his class, the future is now geared to one of the fastest growing companies in America, IBM. For that company, as for the individuals who are part of it, the future has opportunities unlimited. During the past 12 months, IBM has been engaged in one of the most dynamic expansion periods in its history. Examining plans for some of the nationwide new construction, our Executive Vice President A.L. Williams and Vice President and Group Executive H.W. Miller, Jr. with R.F. Bodecker, Manager of Facilities Planning. This is the new electric typewriter plant in Lexington, Kentucky, to be completed in the middle of 1957. The plant had a pilot line in operation less than six months after construction was begun. At Owego, New York, the Military Products Division will manufacture brain, bombing radar navigation equipment for the Air Force's B-52 Intercontinental Bomber. At Sherman, Texas, the new punched card plant will be completed by the end of 1957, and at Endicott, there will be a modern education building. First of the six new plants to be completed was the facility at Kingston, New York, which is devoted to the military products division's giant Sage computer and the assembly of the IBM electric typewriter. Overnight, the entire electric typewriter production line was moved from Poughkeepsie, New York. IBMers had achieved the all but impossible, the move of an entire assembly operation 30 miles without the loss of a single production day. In their new plant, Kingston people found the most modern design elements for employee comfort and efficiency. On assembly lines, each worker could perform several jobs in order to give more variety to his work. Here as elsewhere at IBM, one of the most important considerations is the well-being of the individual IBM employee. H.W. Reese, Jr., general manager of the electric typewriter division, is here inspecting a typewriter component shortly after the new plant was opened. By October, electric typewriters were coming off the Kingston production line faster than ever before in the history of the electric typewriter industry. According to H.W. Miller, Jr., this is a tribute to both the plant people and to the sales force that created the demand which made such production possible. In their conference, the executives discussed the new plant facility at Rochester, Minnesota, scheduled for completion in 1957. Within four months of the start of construction on the first building at Rochester, the building had been occupied and the first products were already being shipped to customers. In San Jose, California, the first phase of a new construction program is approaching completion. Included is space for manufacture, engineering, advanced research, and education. At the end of 1948, IBM had about two million square feet devoted to manufacturing. Upon the completion of construction currently planned, that area will have been increased fourfold. This physical expansion is only one indication of the dynamic growth of the company as a whole in sales, research, manpower, technology, products, and opportunities for individual satisfaction and advancement. During the past year, IBM Research continued to make major contributions to the company and to the world of science. Plans were announced for a major research center at Yorktown, New York, providing facilities for a research staff of 1,600. Earlier, one of America's top flight scientists, Dr. E.R. Piori, joined IBM. Across the Atlantic, IBM was also making research news. This is the city of Zurich, considered the scientific and intellectual capital of Switzerland. It was here that IBM recently established a new research laboratory. 
Among those on hand for the dedication ceremonies were Mr. Thomas J. Watson, Jr. and Mr. Arthur K. Watson, President of the World Trade Corporation and member of the Corporate Management Committee. Dr. Ambrose Spicer, the director, told the press and civic dignitaries of Zurich something of the purposes of the laboratory and of IBM's worldwide contributions to research. Among company executives present were W. W. McDowell, J. W. Birkenstock, and Dr. C. C. Hurd. Mrs. Thomas J. Watson, Jr., who accompanied her husband, is here talking to one of the Zurich IBM scientists. At the Zurich laboratory, European scientists are carrying on basic research in electronics, computer design, and solid-state physics. The laboratory is expected to become increasingly significant as a liaison between the advanced areas of European research and the work of IBM scientists in America. The result will be an increase in man's knowledge of the basic sciences and better products from IBM. The 650 assembly and testing department at Endicott like all IBM manufacturing, is meeting a production challenge in keeping abreast of the phenomenal sales pace set by IBM's field force. The splendid teamwork of the company's sales representatives, applied science people, and field technical specialists has resulted in outstanding sales achievements during 1956. Among these was the 500th installation of an IBM 650 computer. The 650s, which are assembled here at Endicott, are the most widely used medium-sized computers in the world. Nicknamed the workhorse of data processing, the 650 contains thousands of pluggable units, germanium diodes, and individual connections. At Poughkeepsie, other assembly teams are meeting a similar production challenge. For in 1956, IBM's field force passed another landmark with the 100th installation of a 700 series computer. A key feature of the 705 computer is the magnetic core memory unit. These units enable the 705 to remember 40,000 individual characters. Nearby, pluggable units, the small replaceable sections of the computer, are being produced and tested. Before delivery, the 705 is tested for about two months. More than a billion instructions are executed by the machine during this period. Customers who have already received these giant computers include insurance companies, airlines, banks, railroads, and utilities. Major corporations whose names read like a who's who of American industry. The rapid advance of IBM technology resulted in a new department at Poughkeepsie this year to produce high-quality transistors, the tiny equivalent of the vacuum tube. A transistor has an unlimited life, consumes very little power, gives off almost no heat, and requires much less space than would be needed for a vacuum tube. Transistors are made from single crystals of germanium grown in this furnace. The crystals are sliced to minute thinness then sorted in this unique machine, which was designed by IBM engineers. The completed transistors are mounted on a printed wiring card, each card the equivalent of a pluggable unit to form the 608, the first commercially available transistorized computer. The 608 now points the way to the future of computer design and carries on the tradition of manufacturing ability and scientific leadership which are a part of the spirit of IBM. In the fall, the announcement of four new products by IBM made newspaper headlines and television news shows. The four products, 305 Ramac, the 650 Ramac, the automatic production recorder, and the electric typewriter with electronic tabulation were rated by the business press a revolutionary advance in office and factory electronics. The press and our news cameras went on a flying preview to see these products firsthand. The first stop was Norfolk, Virginia, where the 305 Ramac had been installed in the U.S. Navy's enormous supply center. At a press conference held on the base, the Navy's need for the inventory control Ramac can provide was expounded by Rear Admiral J.L. Herlihy, commander of the center. 
Mr. L.H. Lamott, executive vice president in charge of the data processing division, explained inline accounting. And G.E. Jones, the division sales manager, described the machine and how it operates. After the press conference, the 305 RAMAC was demonstrated for the reporters and Navy officials. They learned that with RAMAC, it is now no longer necessary to process data in batches. The random access principle means that millions of facts and figures can be picked out and be made rapidly available. They saw how information is stored by a spinning disk memory. From Norfolk, the press and our news cameras flew to Endicott to see other IBM products. At the Glendale Laboratories, they were to view demonstrations of the 650 RAMAC, the automatic production recorder, and the electric typewriter with electronic tabulation. This group was welcomed by Thomas J. Watson, Jr., who told them, this is the greatest new product day in the history of IBM, and I believe in the history of the office equipment industry. These products provide the most significant advancement toward business control and operation by electronics to be made thus far. Vice President T.V. Learson, group executive, demonstrated the 650 RAMAC for the press. From P.S. Wells, sales manager, time equipment division, they learned how the automatic production recorder can measure results and collect data on a factory production line and forward the information to high-speed data processing machines. They learned about electronic tabulation, which can automatically read business forms and stop the typewriter carriage at the correct typing points. IBM technology once again pointing the way to the products of the future. This is Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, one of the first of more than 30 American colleges and universities to take part in an IBM program of aid to education. As in all universities, Stanford's scientific and engineering departments have the problem of keeping pace in their instruction with the rapid advances of American technology. To assist them, IBM recently made 650 and 700 series computers available to the schools at a small percentage of cost. The computers are used to train undergraduate students in programming. More than 100 students are enrolled in the programming course at Stanford alone. They are used also for graduate and faculty research. At Stanford, on projects ranging from an investigation of the Earth's upper atmosphere to studies carried on by the psychology department. At UCLA and at MIT, the big 700 computers have been installed for the joint use of colleges in these areas. IBM recognizes that these young people at Stanford and the other universities will be the creators of tomorrow's technology. Their scientific training is a vital factor in the nation's continuing technical progress. In the years to come, more and more of these new professionals will be needed in the ever-growing data processing field. The IBM College Computer Program is one of the steps the company is taking to help prepare America's young people for the world of tomorrow. Seated around this table are men planning the birth of a new corporation. This is O.M. Scott, nominated in April 1956 to lead the Service Bureau Corporation, a new IBM subsidiary organized to provide modern data processing services to American business and industry on a contract basis. W.T. McLaughlin, manager of field operations, pinpoints the 84 SBC branch offices to be in operation by the target date of January 1st, 1957. In addition, by that date, a whole new sales force would have to be selected, trained, and ready for the new company. Plans had to be translated quickly into reality to meet the deadline.
One of the first of the new SBC branch offices was in Midtown, New York. Here, as in the other SBC locations, customers find complete IBM high-speed modern data processing machines, manned by highly trained personnel. The full range of problems encountered by modern business are brought to these offices for solution. Payroll, inventory, and cost records for hundreds of customers. Statistical analysis, scientific computation, the simulation by mathematical models of new product designs, industrial processes, and laboratory experiments. To SBC people, their new status offered tremendous opportunities for advancement. Many new supervisory positions were created by the formation of the company. More would develop as the company grew. In addition, SBC employees retained all the traditional advantages of membership in the IBM family. One of the first orders of business for the new company was an intensive sales effort to increase the number of SBC customers. Backing up this sales effort is an experienced and well-integrated operations staff. Their tools are a complete line of IBM punched card equipment. In addition, SBC will have 650 computers in 16 locations to increase the company's ability to serve business and industry in all major regions of the country. 700 series computers will also be available to customers of the Service Bureau Corporation. At World Headquarters, discussing the proposed move of the 704 SBC office are Mr. Scott, T.W. McLean, Vice President and Sales Manager of SBC, and Bruce Oldfield, New York Data Processing Center Manager. According to Mr. Scott, the Service Bureau Corporation's future is one of tremendous opportunity and challenge. The establishment of this newest subsidiary is thus another advance in the progress of IBM toward providing better services for its customers everywhere and greater opportunities for members of the IBM family. This is Paris in October. We are in Paris during one of the major European business shows of the year. IBM equipment is being brought from the Paris office of Place Vendôme to the Porte de Versailles, where the exhibition is to take place. On the opening day, visitors from all parts of Europe saw the products IBM World Trade is offering to the European businessman. These typewriters are made as part of IBM's parts exchange program. Eight European countries make parts for these typewriters, then assemble the machines for sale within their own borders. Thus, a practical inducement is created for international cooperation. A similar plan was started this year among five South American countries. The parts exchange program will be expanded in 1957. In the time equipment section, the visitors saw the electronic system by which all clocks, signals, and utilities in a building can be controlled. The business public's appreciation of the advantages being offered to them by IBM is creating a global opportunity for IBM and its people. On this side of the Atlantic, a similar exhibition is in progress at the New York Coliseum. Here, IBM unveiled many of its latest products for the American business community at the National Business Show. The IBM exhibit, under the lattice canopy, occupied a prominent position in the main exhibition hall. During the four-day show, 143,000 visitors, business and industrial executives, had an opportunity to see some of the ways IBM could aid them in their office and factory operations. They saw the new file feed for the 83 sorter, which permits a 200% increase in sorter running time without reloading. They saw the new card proof punch. The features of RAMAC were explained. This is the 720 printer, which can print 500 lines of type in one minute to match the output of the 700 series computers. The guests examined the electric typewriters with electronic tabulation. A large part of the exhibition was given over to the automatic production recorder, 
IBM's first development to link the factory production line with high-speed data processing equipment upon which management decisions depend. The machine is a major contribution toward one of the objectives of the Time Equipment Division, that of meeting the industrial demands of tomorrow. These are the electronic sentinels of our coastline, the outposts of SAGE, the nation's air defense system. To handle the vast computation problems posed by this far-flung network, the government turned to IBM with its record of proven performance in large-scale business computer systems. To the military products building in Kingston in the early summer came a group of representatives of the U.S. Air Force. With them were G.R. Solomon and C.F. McElwain, General Manager of the Military Products Division. This is General Alfred R. Maxwell, Commander of the Rome Air Force Depot. They were here to inspect the first of the giant SAGE computers. On their inspection tour, the officers first saw the control panel from which the computer will be operated. Information about all the aircraft in its territory will come directly to the computer from the radar outposts. In its magnetic core memory, the SAGE computer will have stored information about the flights of known aircraft and the location and capabilities of the area's defenses. Explaining the memory array is R.P. Crago, General Manager of the Kingston Military Products Plant. From these consoles, air defense would be directed. Upon instructions from the officer in charge, the computer would guide intercept planes and missiles to their targets. About 40 giant SAGE computers are being built by the Military Products Division and are being installed at strategic centers. They are a symbol of the contributions of IBM technology to the safety of the entire nation. With the aid of the lightning-fast IBM SAGE computer, a powerful bulwark has been added to American air defense in the jet age. At IBM today, there are men who are planning the IBM of 1971. These men with backgrounds in sales, engineering, and production are helping management plan for products more than a decade into the future. Such men are W. W. Simmons, M. J. Cammy, P. O. Crawford, Jr., D. F. Lewis, and K. B. McLaughlin. The subject of their conference here is a report on how IBM computers of the future might be used by large corporations to help in such decisions as the location of new plants, the design of new products, or the best ways of marketing. The group's knowledge of the latest trends in technology helps them to anticipate scientific advances of the next 15 years. They also must carry out extensive research on projected customer requirements. In this way, they are able to predict what products should be designed to help meet future customer needs. The group is one more way in which IBM is making sure that its products will keep pace with the increasingly complex needs of our technology. These have been some of the highlights of the progress of IBM in the year 1956. We have seen through the eyes of our news cameras some of the impact IBM is having today on America and the world. But the real progress of IBM is not contained in a company report. It is in the individual progress of all the members of the IBM family. To each of them, these past 12 months have been a period of effort and advance. Their work, their spirit, and their energy have made IBM what it is and point to what it will become. IBM people, the individual people, are the vital factor in the progress of IBM now as they have been in the past and as they will be in the years ahead. <laughs>